How's it going, everyone? Uh, not going to be doing an actual live episode this week, but I wanted to still uh, put just something out there for my patrons. So I've been doing some reworking on the Patreon, which you'll notice if you've been on the page at all. There's just uh, a ton more benefits uh, for each of the different tiers. My goal in all of this is I want to be able to write some good articles for you. I want to be able to record some podcasts uh, with some of my friends that have been playing the game for a long time to give you just some good advice on deck building, card selection, you know, that kind of stuff. And... I think that the uh, the videos like this, this is a great way to communicate as well. People watch a lot of stuff on YouTube. Really, I'm just all about getting the information out there. So, with the metric, I kind of wanted to just like talk about it in general. Um, where it came from, what the origin is of that. And, uh, yeah, I'm planning to post this today. Uh, this is the 4th of June, so uh, again, first and third Saturdays I intend on doing live. Uh, what I did not realize was that YouTube, when you're a new creator, uh, requires a 24-hour waiting period to see if you have any flags. So instead of that, I'm just going to be doing a recording for you, um, and this is going to be like the, the live for this week, right? Um, the metric. So... What the heck, man? Why are you trying to measure everything and ruin the game for everybody? So the the goal with the metric is not necessarily to um, ruin anything, obviously. I don't want to do that. My intention with the metric is to give players a tool to objectively evaluate the power levels of their decks. And how does it do that? Um, if you watched, uh, it's one of my most recent episodes, it's the four core measurements and how those work together. Um, you can actually get a numerical answer to what each card is worth uh, as far as how many points, right? Um, and the nice thing about that is you can see how many total points your deck has, and you can use that as kind of a guideline for your uh, 1 to 5 power level, if you've, uh, I'm going to be posting a podcast in the near future, my playgroup evaluates power levels on 5 tiers instead of on the 1 to 10 scale. Um, because if you look, let's say at spell table or something like that, you're going to be, you're going to find that the 9 and 10 power levels are basically the same. What you are looking for in a playgroup is going to be the same whether you're at a 9 or a 10, whether you're at a 7 or an 8, 5, 6, you get the point. Um, so the, uh, the argument that my friend Adam made, and this is actually a really good one, is the argument of uh, the scientific, uh, how scientific notation works, right? So significant figures. When you're doing a calculation, you're only as accurate as your least accurate number. Um, and let's say you are somewhere between a, you have a, a seven and an eight, you put them together, that's 7.5, but wait, the only numbers that you used to get that were whole numbers. So you actually can only use the seven or the eight, whichever it rounds to, right? Um, so in the concept of representing data effectively, you're going to be looking at something that is a whole number and something that doesn't violate what significant figures are. So we use the one to five scale to evaluate our tiers instead of the one to 10 because it just simplifies things for everybody. Um, when I'm talking about the metric, what my goal is to do is create what's called a standard deviation, which is basically a bell curve and the highest volume of decks are going to be in the center of that bell curve, right? Um, then as you go out, you're going to have less and less within what's called a standard deviation, which is a certain number from the center, right? So let's say 60% of your decks fall into the three range, right? So it's 30% on either side of that, uh, the standard deviation line, which is the very center. Um, 
so if that's the case, then you have another, let's say, you know, 30% um, that are one standard deviation from that. Um, so you're down to like 15, 15, and then you're down to like five and five at the one and at the five range. Um, so most of your decks, what we're saying is are, they're going to fall in the center of that. Most of my playgroup plays at a four power level out of five. And uh, that basically means that we are, we are gearing ourselves toward highly competitive without being CEDH. We're not looking for those two card combos on average. Um, we aren't looking to just end the game without interaction if possible. Um, there are kind of rules, right? We use the, the rule that we can only have four tutors, so anything that searches for anything other than a basic land or basic land type um, and puts it in another zone or in another place. Um, those tutors, we're only allowed four of those in our group. And that was kind of a compromise between one of the veteran players of the group and the rest of us who would like to play combo if possible. The compromise there is that we run a lot more card draw than most other groups tend to do. So that's kind of how you make up for those tutors. So the metric, getting back to it. Why in the world would I want to do something like this? Well, it has a lot of uses, one of which is for organized tournament play. Um, you can't really go in... Let's say, for instance, you were going into a uh, basketball league or something like that, right? And you don't realize that you have an NBA-level team, but you're playing against a bunch of college teams, right? And when you're playing against a bunch of college teams, then you're going to basically stop all of them. But you don't realize that because... It's based on a completely subjective uh, metric, right? So you're just saying, like, oh, on a scale of 1 to 10, I think it might be this. Um, and the more that I've dug into that, the more that I've realized that it's extraordinarily difficult to objectively evaluate your power level if you're not an, a very experienced player, Um and even then, sometimes, if you play in a regularly high-level playgroup, you're going to say, well, this isn't a good deck. But in most other pods, it's going to look like what they think is an 8, right? So how do we get around that? What do we do? My answer to that is the metric, because it assigns a point value to every single card in your deck. And then you can use that to say, I have this many total points. And that within that whole standard deviation uh, bell curve that we talked about, that is going to be where you fall. Um, so if that is the case, if we are able to do something like that, then we have a framework for being able to create, let's say like an app or something like that. And this is kind of my end goal. Um, I'm no programmer. I just really like the math of things. My previous job was accounting. I'm now a full-time dad. Um, and I do this, obviously. Um, you've seen the amount of content I crank out. It's actually pretty substantial uh, for somebody as new as I am to the whole scene. Uh, I've been listening to content for years and years. Everything from like limited to modern to... Uh, I don't listen a lot to Legacy, but I really love listening to the uh, the Canadian Highlander podcast because they do basically what I'm talking about, which is if you had to take this card by itself, what does it look like? Um, the only thing that differentiates my metric from that is basically that it also counts in synergy as one of the four core measurements, right? Because you've got utility, efficiency, synergy, and opportunity. And those four things, when taken in total, give you an exact number for a power level of, of a specific card. Um, and if you can accurately identify that, which if we had an app, obviously would make it a lot easier, um, but I'm not made of money, despite the, uh, the sound of the Roomba in the background, and uh, currently out of a job, obviously, so that's a little bit... Uh, stressful. I have always been the, the primary uh, wage earner for our family, but 
uh, I wanted to be at home with my daughter. So there you go. And when we're talking about that objective level of card evaluation uh, individually and in the deck as a whole, like especially synergy is something that I will harp on over and over and over again. Um, when you're getting up into the higher power uh, level tiers, so like your your late fours, early fives, right? Um, those in particular, you're not as worried about synergy within the deck as you're worried about getting your combo. Um, because you are almost always going to win with a combo in like a CEDH pod. There is very little... Uh, I can think of Paco and Haldan off the top of my head that's like specifically trying to win with uh, commander damage because um, you can like do extra combats, you can do, you know, uh, all kinds of other stuff like that, extra turns in addition. Uh, and same thing with like maybe a, a Narset build or something to that effect it's hard when you're looking at CEDH to utilize the metric. In fact, it's more accurate when you're going from the two to four power level than if you're at those outlying five percenters. Um, but that's kind of the audience we're going for here, right? I'm not trying to be a CEDH uh, content creator. I am trying to give other players the opportunity to not be pub stomping and not get pub stomped at the same time, um, because that just creates bad feels for everybody across the board. I think that when it comes down to it, if this metric were to go through, you'd be able to say, hey, I'm in tier four, um, and this is how many points my deck has. You can basically go to a uh, any of the, like the Command Fest type stuff, which by the way, plug for Command Fest Bellevue, I will be there. I will be handing out stickers. You'll see me in a t-shirt with uh, the uh, Commander Quantified logo on it. Um, and yeah, I'll have some stickers with that logo as well if you'd like them. And I want to get in a few games because let's face it, that's something that we're all going to do. That's what we're all looking for anyway. Um, be there with quite a few of my friends, which is super cool. I'm really glad they're going with me. So being able to go up to one of the head judges or whatever and say, hey, my deck has this many points. It is at this tier level. Um, which, when you're talking about a 1 to 5 scale, I like the idea of using uh, one additional digit. So we were talking about significant figures. I think that being able to say, I have a 4 point, you know, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Um, being able to do that actually does help out a little bit. Because being within point, uh, I would say like point two five to point three. Um, probably within point three of your actual number when it ends out would put you in a pod where you're going to be more uh, active in that. So let's say, for instance, you are a 4.7 going into a five pod. Um, I think that you will not get totally pub stomp because a 4.7 is still going to be a really, really good deck. Um, and if you're going against 4.4 and above decks, you aren't going to completely obliterate them because they are still going to be relatively competitive, right? Um, so if we can get an exact point value per card, which is what we're really doing here, and we can get like the, the synergy addressed, like does it work with the rest of your deck, um, then you will have a better time at all of these different places when you go, the command fests, the, uh, I don't know if you do like GPs, even like your just kitchen table game night. I really enjoy that. Uh, my buddies and I play every Saturday if we can, uh, sometimes multiple times in a weekend actually. Um, so that is a pretty big deal being able to do that. Uh, Sorry, the uh, the vacuum's going on in the background this whole time, so you're getting some of that probably. 
in the recording uh, should be done at this point, which is good. Um, but hey, when uh, wife and baby are gone for music class, then you uh, you only <laughs> you take what time you can get to record, right? Um, so the metric, goodness, the metric I think is extraordinarily useful if we can implement it. It will take a ton of work up front. It requires uh, something similar to like the scryfall tagging uh, of each individual card to say, hey, how many of the how many total functions does it have and how many of them are essential? Are any of those like repeatable or non-repeatable stuff like that? If this channel gains traction, um, I may and I hope it does. I really do, because I think that I I. <laughs> I hate sounding like uh, I hate sounding like I think I'm all that, but I'm I'm really not. I just really like game theory. I am a game designer. I actually have seven or eight board games um, that two of which are pretty much ready to go out to the public if I had the confidence to put them out there. Um, I'm good at this. I really enjoy and have spent a lot of time looking into game theory and being able to quantify how good something is. I do that for my games, and that's why I can say that they have become so well balanced at this point. Um, there is there is no player that usually feels significantly advantaged over the others, even though they have a uh they may have like variable player powers and stuff like that um galactic marauders is one that i've been working on now i think it's uh six might be seven years something like that um the artwork is just stellar uh from my artist arceus legend if you look at him on DeviantArt. I have been working with him for 12 years. If you have a project you need done or a commission, hit him up. He's great. Um, and I do all of the other graphic design work for the games uh, in addition to doing the actual mechanical design. So anything that's not a character is all me, so like icons and stuff like that. Um, all that to say, and I feel like I continue to get off track here, but you're getting a little bit of insight into just who I am as a person at this point. Um, all that to say, I am good at and I enjoy game design, and I think that that strength is what sets my content apart. Um, the game theory that I bring to the table is really different, and I think that with some... <laughs> With some real legwork, the commander community would really benefit from implementing the metric. Um, I gave the base formula in the uh, episode about the, uh, the four core measurements, and I would say that the <laughs> formula extends so far beyond that. Um, I have each individual card type uh, broken down into, I have each individual card type broken down into a zero to one, uh, zero to one, there you go, um, rate for what it is, right, uh, how good is this on a scale of zero to one, one being the very best this card can possibly be, zero being this is the worst card of this type, um, let's say, for example, removal, the basic metric doesn't really work for removal, right, in particular, because it doesn't account for so many things. Um, if you're just talking your utility, efficiency, uh, opportunity, and uh, synergy, that's the fourth one. Sometimes it's hard to remember all these E's, you know? I did alliteration on purpose because it's easier to remember, and then of course I don't remember it. Um, it doesn't that doesn't hit everything right because let's say like abrupt decay is a good example like how do you account for can't be countered right um and some of these things the answer is that you don't you uh you basically say that's not significant enough for me to 
account it into an exact number. Um, and you have to be okay with that because the amount of error goes down really the more calculations that you put in, right? Because if you're just talking the base formula, abrupt decay it has an efficiency of two, so it's all the other stuff over two. Um, synergy usually is going to be a zero. Um, on removal spells, there are exceptions to that rule. Let's say if it's on a body or something like that and has a sacrifice outlet and you're playing aristocrats, right? Um, so synergy would be a zero, so you would uh, not get any additional points for that. Um, the uh, utility of it is it's not repeatable unless, of course, you're playing a, you know, deck that can recur instants and sorceries so again this is an additional thing to factor in i really think that uh the commander itself factors so heavily into the deck that we should be able to factor that into the metric as well um that would be extraordinarily difficult uh like a great example here i play cast dissident mage um but i play it reanimator i don't play like some weird degenerate instance and sorceries combo um not that it's not degenerate to reanimate balefire dragon for two because that's something that i absolutely love doing i like big splashy creatures and stuff like that um but cast gives you the ability to cast every spell twice every instant and sorcery spell twice um it does have to be at sorcery speed which is something that i didn't realize would be so hard to maintain because if you try and cast something with kess uh and somebody counters it you can't go back into your graveyard again and say hey i need to i need to hit that again uh, with like a counter spell but you can hold a counter spell in your graveyard because it's once on each of your turns so it does technically count um but kes counts all of your instants and sorceries as whatever their essential functions are twice right um so that's huge if you get your commander and you get this other spell let's say it's a draw spell like uh oh gosh what's a good example of that you know what divination is not a good card but it'll work for this purpose so normally it's three mana draw two now it counts as two separate cards in the deck so you've just doubled up your ability your card draw um available to you which is pretty crazy when you think about it the metric has a hard time accounting for that um i've been working on how to quantify a combo that is particularly challenging uh combos it's how many tutors can go get it in your deck, right? How many tutors, how many pieces does it require? How many tutors in your deck can go get it? How much mana does it cost in total? Um, and I think there's like a couple of other things that I factor into it. Um, but basically, oh, is it, re do you have uh, repetitive effects? So basically, like, uh, for example, in Loris, I run uh, five different Zulaport cutthroat effects. So whenever, like, a creature under my control dies, I drain somebody for, or I drain all my opponents for one and gain one. Uh, but I have five different effects that do that. So that being a part of the combo uh, makes that particular portion of it weighted heavier like you get more positive points for having more reiterative effects that do the same thing um whereas if you're running and this is where in cedh this becomes more of a challenge because like let's say you're running a uh, dramatic scepter right well there are only two cards that do that dramatic reversal and isochron scepter um, and you need to be able to get whichever one you don't have. So your tutors, if you can, should always get at least one of those two. Um, if you're running black, this becomes very easy because you can run stuff like Vampiric and Demonic Tutor um, or Grim Tutor or any of those other ones. But if you are running something like, say, uh, if for some reason you want to try and do mono blue, you can say, okay, well, I want to run fabricate because that's going to go get my, uh, that's going to go get my isochron scepter or, 
uh, mystic tutor, mystical tutor is going to go get my uh, dramatic reversal, right? So, but those only each get one of the pieces. So that's something you have to consider when you're working around combo. Um, but I think that all of this, because anything anything that we make as humans is quantifiable, especially when it comes to games. Because at a certain point, we break everything down into numbers and everything is to some degree quantifiable. Well, this creature has this mana cost and this power and toughness, which means that we can give it the vanilla test. So we design tests in order to give something a yes or no answer usually. So a two drop two two it passes the vanilla test, right? Um, I think that I have kind of reworked a little bit. So uh, it's uh, limited resources popularized this. And I've basically said like, well, how about this? Power plus toughness over mana cost it has to be greater than or equal to 1.5. Um, so basically a 2-1 would pass, but a 1-1 one, one for 2 would not, right? Um, now let's say for instance, you're running a bond beetle. Okay, it's a one cost green uh, creature, and I think it's like an insect. That sounds correct. It's a zero one, but when it comes in, it puts a plus one plus one counter on something. So technically it's a one cost one two. Is that a good card? Does that pass the vanilla test? And the answer in that case would be yes, but how in the world do we quantify the fact that that adds an additional point of power and toughness to the field? And we have to go into each individual card in Magic's history, over 27,000 of them at this point, uh, and basically say, yeah, this this does this, this does this, this does this. Um, not something I can do by myself, I don't think. I think that would take, honestly, just years of work trying to get everything to, hey, this is an essential, this is a non-essential function, this passes the vanilla test, this doesn't, this tutors for these different types. Um, this particular removal spell can remove X amount of types over, you know, the seven total card types in the game, which, by the way, not that anybody from Wizards is watching this, but the easiest way to expand the game is just to add an extra card type, just something that interacts differently with the game. Um, and then you start completely just messing everything up. It's pretty interesting how that would affect the game theory overall and it's probably why they haven't done it very often like they'll add subtypes to the basics but they won't uh actually go into adding new like super types right um i guess the the backgrounds are kind of like the closest thing they've done recently to do that because background functions like partner right um gosh I feel like I'm getting off on a lot of different rants here, but basically it's extraordinarily hard for the metric to work and be simple. Um, so if we were to develop an app that takes like, let's say you uh, download a deck list um, in just a certain like uh, .csv file, comma separated values, uh, if you download that and then input it into the program, my goal would be for it to give you a one to five power level uh, with one extra point, so like a 4.2. Um, is your power level for this deck. That's the end goal. Of course, that's going to take a lot of time. That's going to be a lot of uh, legwork for me and or anybody else who wants to participate in this. Um, yeah, I think that that's as much as I want to go into as far as the metric. It would be very helpful if it actually got done. Um, but it is going to take a lot of work to do it on the part of the commander community. If we can somehow manage to get that to happen, uh, if we can get enough people to volunteer to tag cards um, and programmers willing to uh, implement this, this metric, these specific formulas that I've come up with into an app, we would have a tool for Wizards of the Coast to be able to uh, do tournament play in a way that immediately uh, puts you in the correct power level for your deck 
um, you can sort people just extraordinarily effectively into the different power levels if you're able to quantify each individual card as well as the deck as a whole. Um, yeah, that's as much as I want to do on that. Uh, this channel is dedicated to developing the metric because that's something that I'm very passionate about, but also just helping you in while I cannot do that. Uh, to have something that emulates the metric, um, to give you the tools that I've developed over the last couple of years to effectively put cards in the right categories, to make sure that they are, to make sure that they're what you want in your deck, to make sure that they synergize properly, that you have all of the utility that you need in your deck, um, that things where you can operate at instant speed, um, especially when we're, when we're talking about control decks. Um, because if you're playing like a more reactive, um, like your control combo, if you saw that graph um, that I posted recently, actually you probably wouldn't have yet because I haven't posted the video, but Archetypes is coming out soon, and this is on there. The graph is basically proactive versus reactive and burst versus sustained. Um, so sustained types are going to be something like mid-range and control, um, whereas burst types are going to be something like combo and aggro. And then you have the ones that are reactive, where I would say combo and control are reactive, where mid-range and aggro are going to be proactive in most cases. Um, so those are each divided into different quadrants of that. And, uh... Just being able to play at instant speed, so that's the opportunity portion of it, right? And then good efficiency. So this is something, this is a warning about the metric, is that it can easily be abused. It can be something that people use to say, well, I'm obviously just going to play the cards that uh, have the most points on this metric, and then I'm not going to worry about anything else. Um I discourage that because it continuously gears you toward more and more uh, high power levels, which, as we talked about in the podcast that I'll release in a little bit here, um, when you get into higher power levels, the social aspect of the game goes out the window in a lot of cases. Um, it takes a lot of discipline to both pay attention to what's going on, to have fun, and to uh, not just want to, not just want to win. It's okay to want to win. Like, Spike is a valid archetype. You, sh If you are a Spike and you are listening to this, I encourage you, like, go ahead and win. Like, do it. That's what causes you joy. But don't do that at the expense of everybody else's fun. Um, what I mean by that is, like, let the combo player get close. Don't eliminate every single combo piece that they put out. Just stop the end one. Just stop the one that's going to, you know, finish off the game. If it's the aggressive player counterspell their overrun effect. They got close, but you know what? It's it's not quite there, right? Um, or if it's not going to end the game, then don't even bother. Just let them have it, you know? Um, one of the prime examples I can think of here is like Itali Primal Storm. It can win the game. It has the potential to do that, right? Um but you never really know if it's going to. You can it can just hit lands off the top or something like that, and then you have and then you just like eliminated Itali, and that player doesn't get to play it. Um, they just paid six mana for something that you path to exiled immediately, right? I'd say that even if you are a spike, if you can, you can still win without destroying everything on the board. Um, and that's actually the mark of a good magic player, is being able to hold your removal until you absolutely need it, 
Um, yeah, so that's my encouragement to you. And also, like, don't play the most. If you're worried about uh, going into too high of a power level in your group, and this is something that we continuously struggle with, play the second best card. So let's say you have a Assassin's Trophy in your deck. Don't play that. Play Maelstrom Pulse. Very similar, right? You're still going to destroy target in this. Then the case of Maelstrom Pulse, it's non-land permanent. It's at a sorcery speed. It's three mana, right? Um, so you just actually uh, changed it to where it hits one less permanent type. Right, so that is lowering the amount of targets, and this is actually where the metric comes in. Right, this is where it shines because you can intentionally move your power level down based on these four factors. You can remove some of your opportunity, you can go from instant speed to sorcery speed that takes the deck down or that takes the specific card down really well. Um, and then you can say, like, it can't remove as much and it's going to cost a little more mana. Um, so playing the second best card, you can actually use the metric to do that. Um, and that's something I'm actually really proud of about it, is that it can be used if your playgroup is playing really intentionally. It can be used to gear down. It can be used to make a two or a one if you absolutely have to. Um, or if you want to, R2 is actually just basically a pre-con deck that we have swapped in 10 cards uh, and taken out 10 cards from the original. And we're not allowed to do more or less than that. Um, we're not allowed to do more than that. We can do less than that if we really want to. Um, but usually you're gonna wanna swap out 10 cards. Um, you can also do it on a budget. That's possible, right? Um, my goal is to let Commander, allow Commander players the opportunity to have more fun um, in the most quandrix way possible by using math to say, hey, I am going to make this deck intentionally worse and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm giving you the how, uh, how to make your decks maybe powered down, maybe a little more fun. Uh, I love uh, Arthur, I believe, on the command cast recently. Uh, he advocated for playing copy spells instead of counter spells. I'm going to say the same thing. I'm also going to add in redirects. Um, the reason that I don't think that counter spells are great, even though you should run them, especially if you're in like the four and five tiers, um, is because they continuously just stop the game. Um, there's a reason there's a deck called Seinfeld built around counter spells, right? Because it's the deck about nothing. Nobody gets to do anything, and that is not fun for anybody. Um, and just saying nope to someone doesn't really work as well. I did a kind of experiment recently with a Kaikar deck that my rule was when I put it in, none of the removal uh, can... I can't include any removal that doesn't somehow replace what I've taken away. Uh, so let's say, for exist, for instance, uh, Path to Exile doesn't give your opponent card disadvantage, it switches out the card, right? Same thing with Chaos Warp, uh, for the most part. And cards like that, that replace, don't have as much feel bad to them. Let's say for example in blue you can run uh, I think you've got raven form gives them a 1-1 one, one bird um, there is a new one that I can't remember the name of it's a two cost instant that gives them a 4-4 four, four elemental uh, there's angelic ascension in white that's one and a white and gives them a 4-4 four, four angel instead of a creature um, you know and then there's like Beast Within, uh, which is a pretty commonly known card. It's two and a green. Uh, you destroy target permanent, no restrictions, give them a 3-3 three, three Beast. Uh, basically the same thing with Generous Gift. It's just two and a white instead. Uh, and it gives them an elephant instead of a beast token. So there are ways to eliminate feel bads that still move your game plan forward. And the players don't feel awful 
counterspell just puts something in the graveyard, which against a reanimator deck is terrible, and that's why I run it so often, because I hate the feel-bads of getting countered, and I would rather be able to reuse my stuff over and over if I can. Um, so, yeah, I would say that there are plenty of ways to use the metric in a way that gears you down rather than gears you up. Um, I think that that's going to be the end of this particular, like, you know, live episode for me. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed talking about this. If you have questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I am on Twitter at CQ Crunch. Um, and that's just because I'm a number cruncher. That's why. That's what I do. I was in accounting. I don't know why. I hated accounting. But uh, data science really, uh, really appeals to me. I haven't gone for a degree yet, but uh, with all the game theory and stuff that I've practiced at this point, it would be kind of silly not to, right? Um, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to leave off. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble through all of this stuff. Um, yeah, hit me up on Twitter if you want to. I also have a Facebook account for Commander Quantified. And uh, yeah, if you're able, Patreon, I would really appreciate some support. Um, I've got tons of videos out there, have done a huge revamp on, uh, on all the different stuff. And I, yeah, I just really appreciate all of your support. Actually, the people who are watching this have already been supporting me on Patreon. So that makes a lot of sense. Anyway, have a great day, and I'll see you in a couple weeks for my next, like, and there will actually be, I promise, the next time a, uh, a live stream. Take it easy, guys.